six years since I left Tibet as a refugee for freedom in India have been hard for Tibetans, including myself. One instruction from our tradition has helped sustain us is to try to transform even the most adverse circumstances into opportunities. In my own case, life as a refugee has broadened my horizons. If I had remained in Tibet, I would most likely have been insulated from the outside world, shut off from the challenge of different points of view. As it is, I have been fortunate to have been able to travel to many different countries, to meet many, many different people, <laughs> to learn from their experiences and share some of my own with them. This suited my own temperament that dislikes formality, which only serves to create distance between people. I do love Dalai Lama in that sense that, you know, the Dalai Lama in a ritual, like an initiation ritual, he can be very ceremonious and very, you know, sort of majestic with his gestures and sort of booming voice and this kind of thing. And then when you meet him in the corridor or whatever, he's like totally Mr. Normal. And he kids around and he shakes hands with the gardener as well as the owner of the house and the security guy as well as the president and whatever. When he visited the first White House where we got him to go see the old Bush, Bush one, when he left, Millie left with him, the dog. The dog came around in the elevator and went and they didn't realize it. And then he, they were going across the lawn and the dog was frolicking along next to him. And the security people had to chase the dog <laughs> to get her to go back to the family. Anyway, so that's, he's, and he has what I call resilience or flexibility of identity. He's not always rigidly the big guru, you know. And he doesn't really like to have horns blown and people jump up and down when he goes somewhere, you know, to announce his arrival like some great marvelous thing. He doesn't like that. So he doesn't do it. As a human being, I acknowledge that my well-being depends on others, and caring for others' well-being is a moral responsibility I take seriously. It's unrealistic to think that the future of humanity can be achieved on the basis of prayer or good wishes alone. What we need is to take action. Therefore, my first commitment is to contribute to human happiness as best I can. I am also a Buddhist monk, so that's now uh, my son, uh, Gandan, who is uh, in charge here, uh, he said that I had to explain to some people what I mean by saying this is a teacher's training course. And um, I did that, and I, there's an addendum that will be mentioned on the website. But uh, really, this is all I mean, is that you know a lot of you are familiar faces. You've come to many of my talks. Some of you may be brand new, I realize. But Especially, I'm sort of tired of introducing everything to everybody. And, you know, I used to, in academia, train graduate students to teach Buddhism academically, which is a little different from teaching it to a practitioner or teaching it to someone who wants to integrate it in their life in the formality of it. Although, actually, students do integrate things in their life, and actually, they should be more encouraged to explore different things and look at them. But, unfortunately, in the corporate university nowadays, they are not. So in a way, in an academic setting, you, you teach about Buddhism. You give like a taste of it, you know, in an about way. Uh, and, um, you know, and therefore, actually, they have a prejudice, actually, in graduate uh, settings that students who teach it shouldn't like it that much, you know, who become teachers. In other words, you can't be a good teacher if you like it, your subject. You know, and supposedly Christians or materialists, you know, are supposed to be, able to be objective about something they teach. But if you're a Buddhist, you can't be objective because you must love Buddhism. So therefore, you know, there was, I, I ran into things in, during my almost 40 plus years of teaching, some obstacles about the fact that how can you be an academic teacher when you like Buddhism? And you even teach Buddhism in a Buddhist setting, like to people who are already trying to be Buddhist or practice that. Although in, the, in, in our culture, we have Jubus and we have we, don't have, we have lots of Chris Boos, but they don't call themselves Chris Boos because they're not as clever as the Jew Boos, probably. <laughs> or they're more annoyed with Christianity. And there should be Mus Boos. There's a few Mus Boos here and there, you know, Muslim Buddhists. And there's a bunch of, what would you call them? Nibus, nihilistic Buddhists. 
that is secular, or sect Buddhist, maybe secular Buddhist. And recently I discovered a person who was a shamanist, you know, like a, a shaman into a indigenous tradition. So we decided she was a shambu. <laughs> so, so anyway, by teacher's training, I just mean that I want to offer a course of things where someone then is going to be capable of explaining as a virtue friend, as a Kalyana Mitra to others, and confidently explain the Buddha Dharma to them. And now some people, if they take the courses, this one in the coming years, if they're psychologists or they're health professionals or something, and they want what are called CEUs and CMUs and all this kind of thing, then they can arrange that. We have a way of arranging that. But I don't certify that except that I'm a, qualified to teach. And a friend of mine from San Francisco has a way of helping us certify that. So that's different. The only thing you'll get as a teacher from me is a certificate after you pass a test after a long time. And uh, then, then you'll get a Tibet house certificate. But I mean, these yoga people who do teacher training, what do they do? They don't go and get something from the State Department you know, or the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. They just give a, a Richard Freeman certificate, that's all. And they, people can get a job in a yoga center. Now, in the, what center can there's a, such a certificate help someone? Well, it helps you in life. And hopefully, if the force for good catches on the way Dan Goldman is showing his holiness wanted to, there's a lot of opportunities to teach which are not in religious settings, in schools, in, in other places, you know, where these things are done anyway. Because what one is doing is, as he said, contribute to human happiness as best one can. That's the basic thing, okay? And now, continuing with Dalai Lama's words, I am also a Buddhist monk, and according to my experience, all religious traditions have the potential to convey the message of love and compassion. So right then and there, he makes his, uh, his commitment not to be trying to convert anyone to Buddhism, which I share, and which this, this not being a Dharma center, we're not asking people to become Buddhists in any way. This is a cultural center. We are asking people to take interest in and to try to help preserve the culture of Tibet, which is in danger. So by saying that, he's saying you can get there by all the paths. You know? And he doesn't mention secularism here. But he also tries and later in other works to indicate that a, sec a good secular humanist can get there. But he doesn't include them here, which I like because I don't agree completely with that idea. I think secularism is a little bit too imprisoning to some people. And I'll explain why eventually. So my second commitment is to foster harmony and friendly relations between world religions. Thirdly, I am a Tibetan. And although I have retired from political responsibility, I remain concerned to do what I can to help the Tibetan people and to preserve our Buddhist culture and the natural environment of Tibet, both of which are under threat of destruction. And that's what this place is, this Tibet house. It's a place that was designed and His Holiness has kept going. And even when sometimes we were tired of doing it and wanted to turn it back to some other people to manage perhaps, he's insisted that we continue. Uh, and, it, and it is his cultural center so far in America his own. I am very happy to see that my old friend Dan Goldman has written this book, exploring and describing how these basic commitments have unfolded over the past several decades. An experienced writer and someone with an active interest in the science of our inner and outer worlds, he has been very, that's very important, in the science of our inner and outer worlds, he has been very helpful to me and is well qualified to express these things clearly as he has done here. The goal of happier human beings living together and supporting each other more fully in a more peaceful world is, I believe, something we can achieve, which might surprise some of us reading the daily news, <laughs> uh, actually, that it's something achievable. He believes that still. But we have to look at it taking a broad view and a long-term perspective. Change in ourselves and in the world in which we live may not take place in a hurry. It will take time. But if we don't make the effort, nothing will happen at all. The most important thing I hope readers will come to understand is that such change will not take place because of decisions taken by governments or at the UN. Real change will take place when individuals transform themselves, guided by the values that lie at the core of all human ethical systems, scientific findings, 
and common sense. While reading this book, please keep in mind that as human beings, equipped with marvelous intelligence and the potential for developing a warm heart, each and every one of us can become a force for good. <laughs> it's really nice, isn't it?